Do you know what nemesis means? A righteous infliction of retribution manifested by an appropriate agent. Personified in this case by me. If you read the Bible, Mark, you'd know that there won't be another thousand years. Right now we're in the last days as foretold in the book of the Revelation. last days? You mean the uh, coming of the apocalypse, right? The rapture. You only have to look at the signs. There are wars and rumors of wars. Now, just so the, the rest of us know how much time is left, when is the rapture supposed to hit exactly? Is it uh, midnight New Year's Eve? That's right. Uh, now, is that midnight L.A. time or, or Eastern Standard Time or what? I mean, what time zone has got in anyway? I pray for you all. Welcome back, my beloved true seekers. The petite yearly dark age that is the holidays is over. Spiritual materialism swelled like a cataract. The demiurge planted false promises of peace and love and easy credit in the hearts of mankind. And the dying rising godmen almost didn't make it back. And may the Christian Lord guide my hand! against your Roman popery. But in the end, as it ever was, the invincible sun has risen. Persephone will soon make her way back to paradise, and coffee, cigarettes, and gnosis has returned after a two-week hiatus. I guess we should call this our second season, but call it what you will as long as you give us good reviews when Nielsen calls you for ratings information. The important dope is that Abraxas, the god above god, is speaking silky delirium to you once again from the virtual Alexandria on this January 7th, 2007. Now open your mind to me. And thus, in our godly aspects, we gather as a pantheon of forgotten deities in order to share in the ultimate expression of our mortal incarnations. From the dawn of time we came moving silently down through the centuries, living many secret lives, struggling to reach the time of the gathering, when the few who remain will battle to the last. No one has ever known we were among you, until now. In Buddhism, it's called prajna. In Latin, it's called intellectus. In Sufism, it's called marifa. In the prosaic eastern ways, it's simply called enlightenment. But you may know it better as gnosis, that salvific knowledge that allows us to bend the false reality that is existence, just enough to gaze to that event horizon of pure blissful transcendence. My God is full of stars. We are gods in the becoming, my beloved true seekers. We are the veterans of a thousand psychic wars attempting to mine that divine spark that was lost deep inside the shafts of our ego consciousness. We are the Gnostics, who will never belong in any time and any place, aliens in an alien world. So set the controls for the heart of the sun because the dark odyssey continues between the gnashing rocks of orthodoxy. I may sound like a lunatic, but I'm not crazy. Not much of my drivel today, though, as we are graced by one of the original translators of the Nag Hammadi Library itself in this epic crusade to understand perhaps the oldest of the Gnostic schools and the earliest of Christian sects, the Sethians. Our guest today is or was John Turner, author of Sethian Gnosticism and the Platonic Tradition, and professor of religious studies at the University of Nebraska. As just mentioned, he was one of the main translators of the Nag Hammadi Library, deciphering from the Coptic such scriptures as the Book of Thomas the Contender, the Trimorphic Protonoia, the Three Steles of Seth, and a whole slew of other scriptures. Professor Turner's other accomplishments are as long as a King Crimson song, and they can be found at his homepage at www.jdt.unl.edu. Again, that's www.jdt.unl.edu. Or just do what I did and Google John Turner Sethian Gnosticism. That might work out better for you. Just admit you're stupid and don't know what you're talking about. 
And please check out his homepage because the good professor has written a herd of very insightful essays on Sethianism and the Hellenistic worldviews for the public good. And once again, like stealing a baby from Britney Spears, we will show you that Gnosticism was and has always been the Christianity before Christianity. Dance with the devil, the devil don't change, the devil changes you. And to the dismay to the more, I need concise answers and a concise hero crowd, there will be more messiahs rolling on a red carpet because it's always a war night at coffee, cigarettes, and gnosis. <laughs> Don't you get it, my dear, people starving for a cult of personality? All these messiahs, all these saviors, from Pythagoras to Buddha, are but projections of your divine potential, hopefully reaching like a laser into the realm of the luminous aeons of the Pleroma, and hopefully rebounding to you in order to awaken the indwelling Christ that slumbers inside your soul. That is part of Gnosis. That is the true pinnacle of human existence. I am immortal. Or you can just pick one savior like Jesus or Mohammed or L. Ron Hubbard and tuck yourself neatly away in a box and allow the powers and principalities to put mailing labels all over it. And around and around we go on the Ouroboros, the snake that eats its tail and represents the almost eternal cycle of birth and rebirth. I believe that as a species, human beings define their reality through misery and suffering. The choice is yours. Abraxas perhaps is the hand pointing at the moon. But you have to crane your rocky neck and gaze at the moon yourself. The Gnostic attitude is coined perfectly in the title of one of Adam Ann's songs, which is Desperate But Not Serious. But the title of a Depeche Mode song works just as well. Your own personal Jesus. And that Jesus is you as Zabraxas is you as Simon Magus is thou. We are all one, but it is our sleep that keeps us separated. So dream yourself to wakefulness, please. Your whole life is just a dream. But enough of my drivel. We march to the interview with Professor John Turner which is also a good, comprehensive treatise on Gnosticism proper. Could you give us uh, just a brief overview of the origins and theology of Sethian Gnosticism? I can try. <laughs> uh, it's a rather complicated sort of thing. And uh, as you know, often when one deals with uh, these kinds of materials, why you sometimes uh, get lost in the details. Uh, but in some way, some of the details are important because uh, Sethianism is probably, uh, I would say, the earliest uh, form of, of Gnosticism for which we have a good deal of documentation. Um, and it seems to be a, a forerunner of Valentinianism. Uh, and there is some relationship between some of the elements of the uh, Valentinian mythology and Sethian mythology as well. Uh, some people prefer to call uh, Sethian uh, mythology uh, or Sethian Gnosticism uh, classical uh, Gnosticism. Uh, also, the you know, approach of uh, Bentley Layton and his uh, book, uh, The Gnostic Scriptures, which is a, a very nice collection of material. The the question most people would have was, uh, is the Sethian Gnosticism the fountainhead of Gnosticism, or is it something that went after, uh, let's say, Simon Magus and Cernelius and uh, Menander? Where exactly does it fall into, or do we really know? We don't really know. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the problem, of course, uh, actually, with, with uh, many uh, of those... Uh, Gnostic theologies uh, that stem from the people that you mentioned. Uh, Simon Magus, of course, was regarded as the arch heretic because he was the uh, earliest one whose existence uh, the Church Fathers were able to uh, establish by identifying him with the uh, figure uh, in Acts uh, chapter 8, uh, the uh, one who called himself a great power. And so the heresiologists, when they deal with this, 
uh, in some way model the development of Gnosticism on their own conception of their model of, of, the, of, of the church, uh, which was uh, more or less hierarchically organized and which they conceived as a kind of, of a sequence uh, of, of bishops who presided over various provinces. And so that's kind of the way they look at Gnosticism as, as well, as, as a kind of tree uh, stemming then from the earliest figures they could come up with, such as uh, beginning, of course, obviously with uh, Simon Magus. And then some of the uh, other figures who do seem to be early, although precise time of origin is undocumented, uh, but one might think of uh, Basilides, uh, uh, Menander, and others that you just mentioned. Uh, so the problem with Sethianism, of course, is that we have no figure that we can identify as the founder of this movement. Uh, none of the uh, Sethian Gnostic documents, uh, possible exception of a rather late one uh, called Marsanes, uh, seem actually to mention a specific uh, Gnostic teacher in a way wandering around in a kind of uh, <coughs> vague wonderland really of <laughs> ideas. Right. In general, the Gnostics then do not like to talk about uh, themselves, say, as a social group. Uh, and in fact, it's even debated as to whether uh, it's fair to say that they actually had uh, a self-identification. So, for example, then when you hear about uh, Sethians and Valentinians, uh, what you're dealing with, uh, is uh, are names uh, which the uh, church fathers have chosen uh, to designate them. But uh, nevertheless, uh, we could get at least to what I think uh, to be the roughly uh, the rough history uh, of this this movement. Uh, it it seems to me that uh, it, it's arguable uh, that um, Sethianism uh, had its origin. Uh, I think in some kind of, of, of uh, Jewish uh, priestly movement. Uh, I'm thinking mainly uh, among those priestly groups which became uh, rather gradually excluded uh, from leadership uh, in the uh, temple, uh, especially during the second and third century, uh, second and first centuries of BCE. And uh, the temple was taken over, of course, by the Zadokite uh, priestly establishment. Right. And this, of course, you've probably discussed with others things about the Dead Sea Scrolls. And right. So the Dead Sea community then would be an example of uh, a kind of priestly community which uh, simply left then uh, the area of Jerusalem, perceiving uh, the temple uh, to have actually been politicized and, and polluted. And so they then went to the wilderness. Uh, in order then that they could worship God in the true heavenly temple, uh, rather than the what they regarded as the corrupted earthly temple. And I think uh, I would tend to see the antecedents of Sethianism then among such groups, uh, since it's clear that the Sethians have uh, a great interest really in the transcendent world. Their view of the transcendent world uh, essentially is uh, centered around the notion of a kind of supreme trinity, uh, which is called often just simply father, mother, uh, and child. Uh, the father, then, is the one that they normally call the uh, great invisible spirit. Uh, the mother is uh, the figure called uh, Barbello, uh, a name uh, that we can't really actually decipher for sure, uh, that's exactly one of the que the burning questions I had because I've heard so many different uh, so many different versions. I thought you might have the you yeah, might have the one, are, John. <laughs> no, I don't really have the one. Uh, there are uh, probably about six uh, rather distinctive uh, attempts to to uh, understand this name. Probably the one that that people uh, I guess mention the most. Uh, would be that it's a, a, some kind of smoothing out of, of a phrase, something like Ba'ar uh, Ba'elo, uh, uh, that is, in, in four is God. The idea then that, that, that Barbello originally represented then uh, the divine tetragrammaton, God. Uh, because, of course, during this period there was a lot of speculation on the divine name, uh, the name, of course, was important because uh, 
uh, in these days when God was thought of as so highly uh, transcendent uh, above uh, the world of, of ordinary human endeavor, uh, the question that arose then, how could God possibly then relate from such an exalted level uh, to humanity? And uh, therefore, there were various uh, attributes of God, uh, which people thought were the means by which God did uh, in some way uh, relate to the earthly environment. Uh, the name of God, for example, or the, the tenting of God, the so-called Shekinah, uh, for those uh, who held on to the earthly temple, the, the idea of the glory of God which dwelt in the temple, uh, and so on. It, it may be that, that Barbello's, uh, the, the origin of the name, goes back to some idea of this sort. But uh, it's clear, though, that in Sethianism, that, that Barbello is, is almost an entirely transcendental uh, uh, mother figure, uh, and acts then more or less then as the consort of the high deity, the invisible spirit. Uh, then, to complete the Trinity, you then have uh, the figure of the self-generated child, uh, who is, of course, a very interesting uh, figure because this is the one uh, that I think as this, you know, what I see to be essentially a kind of heterodox uh, Jewish uh, form of, of, of speculation, uh, becomes then uh, gradually identified uh, with Christ uh, as the Sethian tradition then uh, uh, becomes Christianized, that is, essentially enters into some kind of relationship uh, with the Christians. In any case, then, uh, we could think of it maybe in, I don't know, I guess uh, I've tried to suggest this may have happened in, in uh, roughly five or six uh, stages, so that uh, you begin then uh, with this, this group who, I'm not sure whether they were very aware of a distinctive Jewish identity, but I think that they certainly uh, arose from that kind of general milieu of, of worship uh, in the heavenly temple, which of course then accounts for uh, the uh, very heavy occurrence of uh, acts of, of vision and uh, acts of uh, you know, sort of liturgical praise and so forth, uh, which occurs uh, in the various uh, Sethian documents. Of course, uh, one could therefore, in a way, use a, a convenient designation, uh, since Barbello seems to be the distinctive name, uh, it's clear that uh, uh, among the earliest report that we have of their thinking uh, is comes to us from the hands of Irenaeus, uh, who wrote his work against the heresies probably somewhere around uh, 175 CE. And uh, he refers to these people simply then as Gnostics. A multitude of Gnostics is the term which he uses. But it soon became uh, uh, customary then for those people uh, who used uh, Irenaeus as a source uh, then to try to make uh, Irenaeus' identifications more precise. And so we find then early on uh, the term Barbelloite uh, applied then to this uh, very first group of uh, Gnostics, which Irenaeus discusses. Uh, Irenaeus, of course, begins with a lengthy discussion of, Valen of the Valentinians, uh, tries to say some things about Valentinus and other Valen Valentinian teachers, uh, Marcus. But then by the time he gets towards the end of the first book, of his work against heresies then, uh, in uh, chapter 29, he then uh, talks about another multitude of, of Gnostics. Uh, and so this is the group then that became later more precisely identified uh, as Barbelloites. What's interesting about these people, uh, their hallmark seems to have been a communal rite, uh, baptismal immersion, uh, more than likely in ordinary water that somehow uh, resulted in an experience of, of transcendental vision uh, which was thought then to lead to a complete enlightenment uh, and total salvation. Uh, this ritual was seems to have been called uh, the Five Seals and uh, many explanations have been provided uh, I'm not really positively sure myself why they actually called it the Five Seals, uh, because 
depending on which of the Scythian treatises you read, uh, you can account for the number of five uh, in, in various ways. But certainly the term seal is significant uh, and does suggest, therefore, some connection uh, with baptism, which uh, early on, for example, in Christianity was always considered as a sort of sealing, uh, a uh, right yeah. of initiation, uh, that kind of thing. So, uh, in any case, uh, the, the right was important uh, because it was thought of then as, as the, the instrument of salvation uh, that had actually been conferred by the Divine Mother, uh, Barbello, uh, understood as a kind of universal mother. Uh, and she was thought of then as, as the first thought, uh, a kind of projection of the Divine Mind of the Supreme uh, Deity called the Invisible Spirit. And so then, uh, together uh, with uh, the Invisible Spirit, uh, Barbello then uh, conceives uh, the third member of the Sethian Trinity, uh, who is then called the uh, self-generated child, which is rep represented actually by the Greek word autogenes, which simply means self-generated or self-begotten. And then, uh, very briefly, uh, the, this child then goes on to establish essentially the heavenly realm, uh, which consists of uh, four angelic luminaries. Uh. Uh, and I won't go into the details of that, but uh, one of these uh, luminaries then, finally, usually the fourth of these, uh, then uh, becomes the residence uh, of uh, the figure of Sophia whom I'm, I'm sure you and your guests have discussed uh, frequently. Very much so, yes. Who then becomes responsible, ultimately, for the origin uh, of the world uh, by giving rise to the world creator. And uh, the story then continues from that point on. So, uh, in any case, that seems to represent a kind of uh, first stage uh, of things, as far as I can see in this uh, sort of general history of development of, of Sethianism. But before I, I stop, there, there, there's a second very important component, which is probably the one uh, that, that most people who read about Gnosticism are, are familiar with. Uh, and uh, this is, of course, the very large role uh, which uh, the interpretation of the initial books of Genesis, especially Genesis uh, 2 through 9, uh, play uh, in, in, you know, their story, story of, of primordial times. I'm not sure, then, I, uh, my, my own sense is that uh, this comes probably from slightly different quarters uh, than this kind of Barbelloite baptismal uh, speculation. Really? Uh, I, yes, I, I think so. Uh, probably, uh, again, we, we can use Irenaeus as a guide uh, because as I say, towards the end of, of, of book one, uh, in chapter 29, then, he, he discusses these Gnostics uh, who were later identified uh, by people like Theodoret uh, as uh, Barbelloites. Uh, and then in chapter 30, uh, he then uh, discusses a, a mythological system which likewise, uh, he says, is, uh, is typical of other Gnostics. And then later on, people like uh, Theodoret and Pseudo-Tertullian uh, identified these people as Ophites, mainly, of course, because uh, they thought that the Ophites uh, had a particular interest uh, in the serpent of paradise acting right. as a revealer. And so uh, then the Ophis in Greek, where you get the word Ophite, then uh, is, is a, a word for a snake uh, or a serpent. And so uh, Irenaeus then discusses uh, these views uh, in uh, the succeeding chapter, chapter 30. But it's quite clear that, that their, their sort of metaphysics and theology of the highest transcendental realm is very different than what we see in the Sethians. The Sethians have the Supreme Trinity, whereas uh, these people who became called Ophites actually have a kind of supreme uh, pentad uh, or group of five deities, uh, essentially uh, four male deities uh, and a female deity as well. The female deity then, uh, of course, uh, proving to be Sophia. Uh, 
Uh, and in the Ophite system, uh, the main actor in salvation is the figure of Sophia, whereas in the Sethian treatises, the main actor in salvation is the figure of Barbello, who is, is distinguished quite clearly from Sophia. Uh, Barbello and Sophia share certain share in common, of course, their their femaleness. But uh, quite often, uh, you see that uh, in, in the Sethian treatises that Barbello is usually always uh, sure to be called male. She's the male virgin. And in fact, in later stages of Sethianism, she actually be calls no longer, uh, becomes called no longer Barbello, uh, but the eon of Barbello. And eon, of course, is a masculine term. And so it, it gets you then into some of the background of all of this, uh, the, the, the very interesting role then of, of female deities uh, in Gnostic systems who uh, usually of course end up representing something about the origin of the world of becoming uh, uh, some element of unpredictability some element of daring uh, some element of deficiency uh, whereas the male on the other hand then tends more to uh, symbolize permanence and uh, stability uh, predictability and things of this sort. So uh, Barbello is a very interesting figure because uh, clearly she's a positive figure, uh, but nevertheless she does represent the first stage of emergence uh, uh, from this supreme invisible spirit uh, who is generally thought to be male, uh, which then obviously allows everything else to come into being. So would you say, uh, for example, the uh, secret book of John <clears throat> has both uh, Barbello and Sophia? Do you think, uh, yeah, are you absolutely. saying that they were actually maybe two different stories put together? Well, it or the author? partly to be so, yeah. The Apocryphon, you're uh, very right to bring up that document, uh, because if you were to read uh, these chapters uh, in uh, uh, book one of, of Irenaeus's uh, work against the heresies, uh, chapter 29 and 30 in sequence, uh, you would see that it matches up quite well with the two really major sections uh, of the Apocryphon of John itself. That is, one might well wonder whether the Apocryphon of John then was produced uh, as a kind of fusion uh, of these, uh, these uh, two theologies which I mentioned the Trinitarian theology of the, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, these sort of Barbelloites, these proto-Sethians, uh, and uh, the, this kind of uh, midrash on, on the paradise story on the part of these other Gnostics who became called Ophites, uh, who themselves have a kind of supreme uh, group of five deities uh, rather than the Sethian trinity. And so uh, the kind of material then that you read in, in what's traditionally called uh, Irenaeus's uh, Ophites uh, then seems to correspond roughly to much of the second half of the Apocryphon of John, uh, whereas the uh, Barbelloite material seems to correspond roughly uh, with the first part uh, of the Apocryphon of John, the first part then treating mainly the transcendental world on down say, to its periphery, uh, at the uh, very periphery of the realm of the four lights, where we find, for example, Sophia. Uh, Sophia then deciding that she wants somehow to emulate the creative power of the highest deity, and then produces an accident, because she doesn't cooperate with her male partner or aspect, which then produces the world creator, uh, Yaldabaoth, and then, of course, what everything devolves. Uh, from that point, and that then leads directly to the Paradise Midrash, uh, as soon as then uh, uh, Yaldabaoth and his uh, fellow rulers uh, decide then to uh, create the uh, first human being. And it seems it's uh, probably more complicated, even because as Stephen Davis uh, posited, it was, or I don't know if you agree with this, but the secret book of John was then later Christianized. So you might have three sticky fingers in there. Well, uh, that's conceivable. That is, I do think, uh, if you recall, I began by saying I think that, you know, the original milieu of, of these ideas of a kind of, of 
the supreme trinity, a heavenly world, a heavenly world of lights, and this a sort of uh, baptismal ritual uh, of the five seals, you know, does uh, in a way uh, seem to be not not in, in its origin specifically Christian, uh, despite uh, the fact, of course, that Christianity went on to posit its, its own Trinitarian theology. But it seems to me that it begins then uh, roughly in a kind of, of, of movement at, in the fringes of Judaism, mainly as, uh, among my, my own senses, a kind of disenfranchised uh, priestly component who devise this kind of view of the divine world uh, and, uh, you know, essentially adopt uh, the, uh, or adapt the priestly rites of lustration you know, which were always traditional, uh, end then to a kind of act of baptism, uh, which is mainly uh, designed to produce acts of vision, that is, vision of the transcendent world, uh, vision of the beings that populate it, uh, the, uh, all of these beings, of course, uh, uh, emerging then uh, ultimately from uh, the high deity, uh, and as they emerge, they engage in acts of praise, uh, like choirs of angels uh, of the sort, for example, that we read in, in uh, uh, much uh, uh, Jewish uh, pseudepigraphal literature as well. Uh, but it, there, it certainly does reach a point, and my sense would, would be that this certainly must happen in the second half of the first century, that uh, this movement uh, definitely then intersects with Christianity. We might say that it becomes Christianized. We don't know anything about the process by which this may have happened. Uh, but uh, by, and, by and large, it does seem to me that really both of these movements, uh, if you read, for example, Irenaeus' uh, description of this, Ir Irenaeus is interesting uh, because he clearly describes, uh, first of all, uh, this kind of... Uh, uh, Barbeloite theology, but notice that uh, there, of course, uh, it's already uh, Christianized uh, because the figure of Christ appears. And then uh, also he goes on to discuss then this this next this this sort of uh, uh, lengthy interpretation of uh, uh, Genesis two through nine that was uh, later attributed to Ophites. Uh, and it's clear that that system also is Christianized, right? Because uh, one of the one of the members of the uh, supreme pentad there uh, is, in fact, of course, uh, Christ, who is considered to be there the elder brother of Sophia. Uh, but then again, uh, the real worker through most of that uh, is the figure of, of Sophia, and as in the Apocryphon of John, she then becomes responsible for. Uh, the origin of the world creator, you know, double oath, uh, trouble breaks out, uh, and then the story reads very much uh, as we find it in the Apocryphon of John. But then uh, it's then damage that's been done is, is ultimately rectified then by Sophia uh, acting in concert with Christ. Uh, whereas in the uh, Barbeloite system, that actually Sophia's mistake has to be undone by this higher mother figure called Barbello. I think the one thing that we're missing, and as you uh, write in your essays, is uh, this group of priests who left the temple, they ran, They must have ran into some uh, Neo-Pythagoreans or uh, Platonists, isn't that correct? Most all uh, literate Jews, uh, I would think, Certainly throughout the first century, uh, BCE and uh, onwards, uh, were, I think, probably well aware, at least in a popular sense, of uh, the Platonic and the Pythagorean traditions. You know, Pythagoreanism is an interesting case in itself, uh, because, of course, we find uh, that, uh, you know, uh, early on, for example, uh, when... Uh, you know, even in the early academy, you know, that uh, Plato was 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 thought to have been, you know, well versed in Pythagorean uh, doctrines and so forth. Some of his uh, earliest colleagues, you know, people like Archytas were were Pythagoreans. Uh, but uh, then, you know, as history goes on in the Platonic Academy, there was ultimately a reaction uh, against this. 
that is that they they felt that by and large uh, Plato had become a kind of dogmatic uh, metaphysician, especially in his later dialogues and in his so-called oral teaching, and that therefore he had ultimately been untrue to the teaching of Socrates, who himself then is never represented as speculating about transcendent uh, principles and uh, and so forth, and so uh, by and large they they rejected this kind of transcendental metaphysics of, of Plato. Uh, and this then was the so-called skeptical or new academy. But then, uh, interestingly, somewhere around the first century BCE, uh, all of a sudden, uh, this kind of, of Platonic metaphysical speculation about ultimate principles and the one and the dyad and so forth suddenly reemerges uh, under the name of Pythagoras. And so, uh, in a very interesting way, uh, Plato's the very, very, very highest metaphysical teaching uh, becomes claimed for for Pythagoras, uh, and this is the birth of Neo Pythagoreanism. Uh, and in their system, uh, wasn't the monad the uh, supreme being? Do the Sethians borrow from that, or call the supreme being the monad, or is he always the invisible spirit? No, actually, it's interesting that right at the very beginning uh, of the uh, of the Apocryphon of John, there's the suggestion then that the supreme invisible spirit. Uh, is a monarchy, is a monad. And uh, the idea, of course, then, is that the metaphysical problem, you know, that, that I think, in a way, all of these people try to deal with, of course, is how can the many come from the one? And this is the problem that Neo-Pythagoreanism uh, focused upon. You know, in some sense, they, 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 they took it uh, almost as, uh, as an axiom uh, that uh, somehow, you know, the ultimate essence of the world must be simpler than what we perceive it to be. And therefore, all things then must have come from some one thing. I mean, it, it almost has a kind of an analogy and certain speculations about the Big Bang Theory, you know. And so they then began to speculate along these kinds of uh, numerical uh, lines. Uh, that somehow then the one, by some mysterious process, which is never successfully explained, uh, gives rise to the two, and then the one and the two interact to produce the three, uh, and then uh, you uh, then have you know the possibility of a dimensional world, uh, and then finally uh, you get uh, the uh, you know uh, finally uh, a four, uh, and then uh, a four is is, is you know, seems to be appropriate for discussing a theriometrical three-dimensional world. Say, well, then that represents the world that we uh, can touch, taste, and feel. And so, you know, it, it comes then by this kind of interaction of, of these principles, which are given names uh, for these, you know, these primary numbers, uh, the one, the two, the three, and the four, which add up to ten. That is essentially the, the Pythagorean tetractus, as they called it. Uh, but the sacred decad. Find then uh, this uh, reflected, the, you know, to a certain extent in the Gnostic treatises themselves. More especially, I would say, in, in Valentinian treatises, where it's quite clear that the whole description of the transcendent world uh, operates in terms of, of ones and twos and fours, and uh, that these ones combine together in ways to produce a certain numerical groupings. Uh, so this is widespread, and in fact, uh, the, one of the documents in the news uh, recently, the Gospel of Judas, uh, which uh, is, is quite interesting, uh, but itself contains a kind of sketch uh, of the of this kind of uh, Sethian theogony or story of, of the birth and the development of the divine world and its gods, uh, and it engages in a tremendous amount of numerical speculation. Uh, which interestingly seems to be uh, quite clearly reflected uh, in another of the Nag Hammadi documents, uh, of which we have two copies in Nag Hammadi, uh, called Eugnostus uh, the Blessed. Uh, and uh, it talks about the various pairings of these and 
uh, groups of four and groups of six, and ultimately become then 72. And then uh, this is then multiplied by five to become uh, 360, uh, which then is uh, the you know the number of the uh, year uh, days in the year uh, minus the five uh, intercalary days and so forth. It's actually uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask you, um, because uh, <clears throat> Irenaeus says the Gospel of Judas was written by the Cainites, but even uh, as you've just said, it seems much more of a Sethian work. Is there a connection between the Cainites or the Sethians, or, or could we possibly be talking about two different Gospels of Judas? Boy, that's a complicated question. <laughs> Sorry. I'll say both no and yes. <laughs> uh, no, in the sense I don't think there was ever any group of uh, Cainites. Irenaeus's text itself never names any people called Cainites. Uh, this was a name that was again added later by his epitomators. Uh, people like uh, Pseudo Tertullian and, uh, and uh, uh, Epiphanius and uh, Theodoret. And now we're getting, what, quite late into the uh, fourth century. Uh, whereas Irenaeus, of course, is a figure at the end of the second century who, who never knew these names. I don't think uh, Irenaeus knew anything about Barbelloites or Sethians or Ophites or uh, Cainites. But uh, at the same time, uh, there is something tantalizing here. You see, uh, all men uh, Irenaeus mentions are Gnostics. First, the multitude of Gnostics, right, who were the people who exhibit this, uh, this uh, what I've tried to characterize as a Barbelloite theology. Based. Then he goes on to discuss uh, these people who uh, have a kind of supreme pentad, who became later called Ophites. Um, and uh, who concentrate or are basically fascinated by uh, the paradise story. And all of that then seems to be focused around the, uh, the creation of the first human, uh, his uh, struggle then uh, to become uh, enlightened. And then finally, that's in chapter 30, and then in chapter 31, uh, then there is this other group, uh, and it's in that context that he mentions this Gospel of Judas, but he doesn't call these people Cainites. Uh -huh. The figure, of course, of Cain is mentioned uh, as being, you know, a kind of an anti-hero along with uh, the, the Sodomites and Korah and other sorts of rebellious figures. But then he says that these people then uh, uh, are utilizing a, a certain Gospel of Judas but then he goes on to suggest that uh, that uh, Judas, of course, was a specially enlightened figure, and that uh, through his acts, uh, that he uh, ended up throwing the whole world into confusion. Well, that doesn't really tell us very much. But then when you come on to the later epitomators, uh, people like uh, Pseudo Tertullian and uh, uh, probably in the early third century, and then uh, Epiphanius uh, and uh, Theodora in the fourth. Uh, then suddenly we learn a lot more about this, and they're concentrating, of course, then on this notion that somehow uh, Judas is the one whom we really ought to thank uh, because he ensured them the handing over of Jesus, uh, which resulted in the supreme act of salvation for the church. Well, uh, of course, that idea does not show up uh, in the Gospel of Judas, uh, in spite of what its original editors uh, have said about it. Uh, my own sense is that the preliminary version that we all have uh, is, a, is a, in a way, a kind of colossal misreading of that document itself, uh, uh -huh. for various reasons, which I won't get into. But... Uh, it, it's certainly true that in the version that we have, yes, indeed, God, uh, Judas is a specially enlightened figure, right? But uh, unfortunately, he is a mere dupe of the stars. And so when he hands Jesus over, it's not at all because Jesus asks him to do this in such a way, therefore, that Judas can help effect uh, this kind of uh, sacrificial act of salvation through Jesus, uh, but it's merely that, that he is a victim. He's predestined by the stars to do this, and Jesus merely predicts that that's what Judas is going to do. Quite clear, then, that something is, is amiss. And then, of course, coupled with the fact that once you pick up uh, the Gospel of Judas, 
and you get on down towards page 51 and so forth, why suddenly you've got this very, very long uh, Sathian Theogony, uh, very true. Which, which ends, of course, then with uh, the, uh, the, the, the creation of the human being. But then, oddly enough, uh, at that point, it's rather completely unlike uh, the Apocryphon of John and its uh, sort of similar story, the, the Ophite story of, of, uh, of paradise, because uh, suddenly, uh, although uh, our figures like Saklas and Yaldabaoth, you know, become, as it were, the evil creators of the world, suddenly then uh, there's no more attention to the paradise story. And uh, you know the place of uh, the creation of you know what, once once Eve and Adam arise, that's it. That's the end of it. And there's no long, no any no account of the long series of moves and counter moves, you know, between <laughs> the divine world uh, and the evil creator Yaldabaoth. And so it, it it's odd because it's it's like then if you compare it to the Apocryphon of John, much of the material in the second half of the Apocryphon of John. Uh, which has to deal with that fascinating story uh, of moves and counter moves between the transcendent world and this world is missing. It's not there at all. And so, uh, yes, it's clear, therefore, that we have a kind of uh, Sathian story here uh, in the second part of the Gospel of Judas. But, you know, it, it just, as it were, sort of ends uh, once the, the, the world has been brought into being and uh, the primal pair uh, arises. And uh, at that point, uh, the Sufian material stops. So my own sense is that, that I think we're dealing with a, a, a document which must have existed in several forms. Uh, one form then probably known to Irenaeus, uh, and then another form according to the text that we, we possess today. Uh, but I don't think that they were necessarily one and the same document. Most of the listeners already understand that, uh, you know, there were three forms of people, the Hylix, the Psychics, and uh, the Pneumatics. Do you see in uh, Sethian literature uh, some sort of uh, similarity to that? Don't, didn't the Sethians believe that they were the perfected race? Yes, yes, they, they did. Uh, in fact, the reason why it's legitimate to call them Sethians is because it does seem that uh, they, they actually did have a self-designation, unlike most other Gnostics. Uh, for example, Valentinians never called themselves Valentinians. Just as Christians, yeah. They just called themselves Christians. And uh, certainly the Sethians, I don't think, called themselves Sethians. But they did call themselves the seed of Seth. Uh, they also thought of themselves, uh, in some sense, as somehow all, what victims of... Uh, what a kind of hostile world system, and by comparison then to most people, they thought of themselves as rather uh, pure, that is, they certainly have a tendency towards asceticism. And so the frequent, uh, uh, most frequent self-designation uh, seems to be then the worthy. They call themselves the worthy. But certainly uh, the seed of Seth uh, is, is uh, a fairly distinctive uh, self-designation. Now, then when you come to the question you raised, Miguel, about, for example, this kind of tripart division of humanity uh, into the pneumatics, say, specially enlightened, perhaps enlightened, even saved by nature, uh, and then uh, essentially the sort of uh, psychic people, that is, uh, in some sense, people who were on the way to Gnosis, uh, but uh, nevertheless, you know, had to engage in, in the struggle for uh, purity uh, and so forth. These are really the people, in some sense, to be saved. And then what? Finally, uh, the 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 Hylix or the material people, uh, who are beyond the pale and uh, will be excluded. Uh, this seems to be uh, a product, especially of the Valentinian schools. Mainly, uh, I, it may have originated actually with uh, Valentinus's successor Ptolemy. Uh, and the way in which he tried to approach these questions. But, for example, you don't see much evidence of that in Heraclean. Uh, and certainly in Sethianism, I, I can see, what, no evidence that they carved humanity up into these, uh, these uh, categories. If you read the Apocryphon of John, it becomes quite clear there's, 
towards the middle of the Apocryphon of John, there's, there's a kind of question and answer dialogue between uh, uh, Jesus and, uh, and John, the son of Zebedee, uh, where uh, John asks Jesus a, a series of questions about the salvation of souls. And it turns out that everybody is, but there's only one class of people who, in some sense, is beyond the pale or damned. And that's the people who grasped the truth and then later rejected it, the turncoats, the apostates. So uh, I would suggest that in some sense that, that the you know, Sethians do not seem to have made this kind of general distinction. I, I, I would gather, you know, in some sense, everyone uh, has this kind of possibility for salvation. That, that what they need to do is, of course, then to be, to be uh, awakened so that they can get a much better grip on life and uh, assess their, 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 their position in the world. And then, of course, in the Sethian corpus, I mean, there's, it's, as I say, it's a rather large corpus. I mean, you've got 14 uh, original Gnostic treatises, uh, for example. The, uh, uh, obviously, you've mentioned already the granddaddy, the Apocryphon of John. Uh, but uh, so it's a, a very well-documented thing. Uh, of course, to this now we have to add the present version of the Gospel of Judas that we have. Uh, but then, of course, uh, a number of reports on the part of heresiologists. We've discussed, of course, mostly Irenaeus, but then also we see this uh, in the people who later copied Irenaeus, uh, and uh, even more information from uh, in the fourth century from the church father uh, Irenaeus. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Epiphanius. So you know, we have then, as it were, a lot of versions of the Sethian story. And uh, one of the interesting things that happen, of course, is if I could back up a minute, I talked no a little bit about my speculations of, of this arising in some kind of you know, Jewish priestly environment. Uh, but then it's quite clearly, it then becomes uh, Sethianized. That is, that the figure of Seth somehow becomes important. And we don't know exactly where this comes in. But I think... It probably arose in some context, some polemical context, either uh, with other Christians or possibly with with other Jewish exegetes of the Book of Genesis. You know, one of the refrains in the Apocryphon of John, of course, is what not as Moses said, says Christ, but it is as as I now tell you. Right. And uh, one then begins to wonder then, well, how how does the figure of Seth come into all of this? Well, you know, uh, Seth is an interesting figure in some other contexts. For example, uh, 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 Josephus' Antiquities mentions, for example, that Seth played a special role in preserving primordial knowledge, the primordial knowledge of the arts of civilization by inscribing them on, on uh, uh, stone and brick steles. And uh, we see this also in another interesting work, uh, which has nothing really to do with Gnosticism, called uh, uh, The Life of Adam and Eve, which exists in, in several versions, Armenian and, and, and Latin and so forth. Really? Never heard of it. Hmm. Yes, right. It's a very interesting work. Uh, and in fact, you can consult it on the web. Uh, just you know, look for the, the Life of Adam and Eve. I think it's maybe Michael Stone, which has uh, put together an interesting collection of the various uh, variants of that text. But I think that is possibly the key. In other words, why not, as Moses said, because Moses, like, Moses wrote the book of Genesis, and it's his story about paradise. But Moses was never in paradise. Who was in paradise? Adam was in paradise. No. Seth, paradise. And therefore, uh, for example, in the Sethian treatise, The Apocalypse of Adam, there we have it, what, right from the horse's mouth, right? <laughs> Adam reveals to his son Seth what really did happen in paradise. And the assumption is there, what, Moses came later, right? He was the one who became a devotee of the God who revealed himself in the burning bush and gave the law on Sinai. Uh, and so if you really want to know the true dope about what happened first... <laughs> Then you should consult Adam and Seth. And I think that's ultimately how the figure of Seth became very important uh, for the Sethians. And in fact, of course, uh, Seth, uh, since you know uh, he is 
you know, according to uh, Genesis 4 and 5, he, he is the other seed that was born in the place of Cain who killed Abel. That, uh, and, and in fact, the priestly genealogy in Genesis 5, what connects uh, Seth uh, directly, you know, with, with Adam. What's unique about Seth, that unlike anybody else, he was born in the image of his father Adam, but then we, of course, know that Adam was born in the image of God. Uh -huh. So clearly, Seth is another image of God, which again gives him a certain special authority. And so I think through observations of this sort, that's what attracts them interest in the figure of Seth. And then, of course, uh, as this uh, Sethian tradition uh, becomes uh, Christianized, uh, especially, I think, throughout the second century, although I think problems begin to break out towards the end of the second century, uh, then he, uh, Seth, of course, what begins uh, becomes identified with uh, Christ. Or uh, he's a, regarded as appearing on earth in the guise of Jesus. And uh, two very interesting uh, documents in this regard would be the Trimorphic uh, Protonoia, for example, where uh, uh, Protonoia uh, descends in some sense to save Jesus from the cross. Or even more in the Gospel of the Egyptians, where what? It's precisely Seth who was then identified uh, as the one who puts on uh, the body of Jesus and descends uh, to attack and overthrow uh, the hostile archons of the 13 eons and so forth. How does Norea come into the picture? Is she in later uh, edition? Or is there any tradition? Uh, it's interesting. Uh, you know, in, 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 in uh, Jewish literature, uh, it may be that the original name was Naama, something like that, which means beautiful, but, but this clearly is the figure of, of Norea. Uh, be, is, is understood as the kind of wife sister of Seth, although there are occasionally you find other uh, identifications as well. And one of the Sethian treatises in the Nagamati Library is named Norea, and uh, she also, of course, becomes a prominent character. Uh, in a problematic document in Codex II, uh, where the Apocryphon of John is found, but there's also a work called The Hypothesis of the Archons which is uh, thought to be a Sethian document, but is only very weakly Sethianized, mainly because uh, uh, one of the revealer figures uh, who comes to the aid of uh, humans at the time of the flood is uh, the angel Elelef, who is the traditional fourth of the luminaries uh, in Sethian theology. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, Norea uh, tries in some way then to uh, oppose uh, uh, the, the, the Archon. The Archon has a stratagem that he's going to uh, save the race of humans uh, uh, by having Noah build the Ark. But Norea knows that this is really a trick, so that if humans then survive the flood, why then, you know, that Yaldaba Oath will still be around and uh, will still enslave people. So she tries to burn the Ark up. But then, uh, she, then uh, the Archon set upon her, and she cries out for help to the angel Elelith. Uh So it's interesting there that it's, it's not then at all Seth who acts as the savior figure in this document, even though... Uh, Hans Martin Schenke, who developed the original hypothesis of Sethianism, thought uh, the hypothesis should be a Sethian work. Uh, but uh, it's actually Norea, not Seth, who then becomes uh, the kind of spokesman for uh, Gnostic enlightenment and so forth. Another question which I thought was interesting is uh, Marvin Meyer in the Gnostic Bible puts uh, Thunder the Perfect Mind as a Sethian work. What is your stance on this? I'm not so sure. Uh, this is not his idea, of course. Uh -huh. uh, it was developed uh, by Bentley Layton uh, back around uh, 1984. He wrote a very interesting article called The Riddle of the Thunder, mainly on the basis of certain testimonies we find in uh, Irenaeus's uh, uh, treasure chest uh, <laughs> against heresies. There, uh, Epiphanius mentions a certain gospel of Eve, uh, and there's a, a statement attributed there that sounds uh, very much like the sort of uh, thing that you get, uh, especially in the first paragraphs of uh, the work, The Thunder. Uh, this kind of riddling uh, identification. Uh, but it's interesting 
that we find uh, the same kind of riddling on the occasion of the creation of Eve uh, in two works in, in Nagamati Codex 2, the one I've just mentioned, the Hypothesis of the Archons, but also in a, in a sister work to that, which is has very few traces, not really no traces of Sethian theology, and it's called, it, it actually has no title in Codex 2, but we call it On the Origin of the World. It's interesting. Uh, the uh, material, for example, that we find uh, in uh, in, in the thunder, uh, you know, latent solution uh, to this, of course, is that the thunder uh, is to be really identified with 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 Eve. Uh, mm-hmm. But I mean, in some sense, she could be uh, identified with almost uh, any of these figures, say, such as Norea, uh, so on, or even Isis. <laughs> well, sure, uh, and of course, mainly on the grounds of of the. First uh, person self predicatory statements, very typical of the Isis heretologies. Uh, but it, it reads something like this I am the members of my mother, I, it is I who am the mother and the daughter, it is I who am the wife and the virgin, uh, I who am the baron, I who have many children, uh, it is I am the one whose marriage is magnificent and uh, who have not married. It is I who am the midwife and she who does not give birth and so forth. These kind of antithetical then self-predications. Well, then you go on uh, to uh, uh, the origin of the world, for example, uh, and then uh, you see uh, the, the story uh, as follows, uh, uh, where it says, uh, Eve then is the first virgin uh, who gave birth to her first offspring without a husband. It is she who served as her own midwife, and so for this reason she is held to have said, It is I who am the member of my mother, it is I who am the mother, I am the wife and the virgin, I who am pregnant, it is I who am midwife, it is I who am consolation of travail, and so forth. Mm-hmm. And then in the hypothesis of the archons, right, uh, which uh, comes then immediately before uh, this, uh, this uh, thing we call on the origin of the world, it says, the spirit-endowed woman came to him and spoke with him, saying, Arise, Adam. When he saw her, he said, It is you who have given me life. You will be called mother of the living, for it is she who is my mother, it is she who is the midwife, uh, and she who has given birth. Ah, that's how they got the connection. Sure. And so, you know, it was originally Leighton who, who uh, worked this over, and so, you know, in this case, Marvin uh, Meyer simply... Uh, adopted uh, Leighton's ideas. What other text uh, would you recommend for somebody who's interested in Sethian literature that you've translated? Yes, I would always uh, suggest maybe beginning with the Apocrypha of John. And then I, I've already mentioned uh, uh, two others in the course of our discussion. Uh, the Hypothesis of the Archons, a, a little tiny section of which I just read. And then uh, an, another very interesting one, uh, the uh, Sacred Book of the Great Invisible Spirit. Spirit, uh, which is popularly known as the uh, Gospel of the Egyptians. Uh, the Gospel of the Egyptians occurs in, in the Colophon, but that's not actually the title of the work. But you can see the title of the work features, of course, the supreme uh, Sethian deity, the great invisible spirit. But this is very interesting because it tells us a lot about uh, you know, the uh, Sethian ritual. Uh, a long section, clearly uh, baptism, but then possibly other acts uh, such as anointings, uh, certain kinds of symbolic gestures uh, made with one's hands to illustrate uh, the vision of the divine world and the reception of light. I think I also mentioned briefly the apocalypse of Adam when I was talking about why Seth Mm -hmm. uh, seems to play a role in Sethian Gnosticism. And this whole tradition, for example, about the steles or tablets or pillars of Seth that we see in Josephus and the lives of Adam and Eve, and we have a treatise called The Three Steles of Seth that comes right at the very end of Codex uh, 7. Uh, then the granddaddy uh, of the Sethian works, the longest uh, treatise in the Nagamati Library, uh, is uh, by the name of Zostrianus. And uh, then uh, there, there are others. Uh, the shortest of all, called The, the, the Thought of Norea in, in Codex 9, Melchizedek, which unfortunately is very highly fragmentary, uh, 
but nevertheless a very interesting treatise in which it seems that uh, Jesus Christ and Melchizedek are somehow identified with one another as uh, enlighteners, uh, and that's also in Codex 9. But the things that, that I've worked on mostly, uh, actually, uh, if, if recently, uh, is, has been the connection between uh, Sethianism and the history of Greek philosophy, uh, which comes uh, out primarily in, in uh, the Three Steles of Seth, uh, the long work Zostrianus, another very interesting work, uh, the Elogenes, uh, which uh, seems to me to be probably the first uh, evidence in Western history uh, of the doctrine of learned ignorance, right, as part of the mystical experience. Really? Yes, that one uh, actually uh, uh, ultimately comes to understand the highest deity, to know the highest deity uh, by not knowing him. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the, uh, the, the, the the treatise, the Trimorphic Protonoia, that comes uh, from uh, what was a 13th codex, although it was originally discovered tucked in the inside front cover of Codex 6, but it once was uh, a complete codex in itself. But the Trimorphic Protonoia, that is the three-formed uh, first thought of God, uh, is interesting because of its uh, very, uh, it too is very much like the thunder because it's full of self, uh, first person self predications uh, of what? The Divine Mother, who uh, here is called Barbello, she's called the first thought of the high deity, and it has a, an amazing similarity to the conclusion of the Apocryphon of John, uh, a kind of uh, uh, poetic triptych, uh, a monologue of, of, of uh, the divine uh, pronoia, the divine first thought of Barbello that occurs right at the end of the Apocryphon of John. And the Trimorphic Trotonoia seems to be a kind of an expansion of that. But anyway, coming back to these uh, ones that I mentioned, uh, which I conceive actually to be the latest, uh, that is, at some point towards the end, uh, I think, of the second century, the turn to the third, this uh, kind of loose alliance between uh, the Sethians and Christianity in general uh, fell apart, uh, mainly because the two became engaged in, in polemics. That is, that uh, I think that uh, Christians and the sort of wider sort of so-called apostolic churches came increasingly to object to the Sethian Christologies, that is, this kind of identification uh, between Christ uh, and Seth, for the Sethians, it was a natural identification because, you know, Paul thinks of, of Christ as being in the image of God. The Sethians think of Seth as being in the image of God. So clearly they're both images of God, so in some sense they must be inter-identifiable. Uh, but, but there were Christian theologians, uh, obviously, who, who objected to this kind of thing. And uh, so I think what happened that the Sethians then gradually parted company with Christian tradition, and they enter into a new phase, which is pagan. And the evidence for this would be these uh, these documents, the three studies of Seth, uh, Zostrianus, uh, Allogenes, and Marsanes, uh, which show uh, almost not a trace of evidence uh, of any connection with Christianity. The figure of Christ plays no role whatsoever. Uh, and they are highly metaphysical documents. Uh, what's interesting about these, of course, is that two of them, we know for sure, Zostrianus and uh, Allogenes, uh, were read in uh, Plotinus' uh, third century uh, seminar in Rome, uh, somewhere around the year, uh, probably, uh, I would say, somewhere between 245 and 265 CE. And that's interesting because that's, that's a kind of datable occurrence. So we know Plotinus read these. And in, in his refutation of the Gnostics in Ennead 2.9, uh, Plotinus actually cites uh, Zostrianus. And then there are, of course, other interesting connections. Uh, for example, it's clear that the, uh, that the, uh, that the uh, fourth century uh, theologian, uh, Marius uh, Victorinus, uh, whom St. Augustine mentions, of course, as having been a great inspiration to Augustine. He was a great rhetorician in Rome who can, became in late life converted to Christianity. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's mainly through figures like uh, Victorinus that 
uh, Christianity then came into uh, possession, you know, of all of these uh, Neoplatonic ideas, and uh, he translated Plotinus into Latin and uh, many other things. Uh, but interestingly, uh, it's uh, this this fourth century theologian Victorinus and the treatise Zostrianus uh, share word for word a kind of common source. Uh, which has raised a very interesting question in the history of Greek philosophy uh, that centers around what was the origin of the theological interpretation of Plato's Parmenides? I'm sure you've seen references to you know, this idea of negative theology, the sort of thing that you encounter almost at the very beginning of the Apocryphon of John. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. The main God is not this, not this, right. not that, and traditionally we connect it with you know, uh, the second half of Plato's Parmenides then goes on to discuss right. the problem of unity and, and otherness uh, in terms of uh, uh, these eight hypotheses. And the first one, therefore, is the consideration uh, of the one pure and simple, right, uh, that you can't even attribute being to it, uh, and so on. Well, uh, it's clear this has made an impact in these negative theologies, and we see them uh, in the uh, Suthian treatises. And my sense is, what it suggests is that, that quite possibly it was the Gnostics who even before Plotinus may have uh, been instrumental in originating this kind of religious uh, theological interpretation of the Parmenides, which before their time was regarded for the most part as a kind of logical exercise in dialectic. Uh, so, I mean... In, in various ways, these these treatises then uh, you know prove to be enlightening then not only for the history of religion but also for the history of, of Greek philosophy. That's what I wrote my book about, uh, called Something and Gnosticism in the Platonic Tradition. Well, John Algott, I would love to. God, I certainly would love to chat some more. Uh, maybe we can uh, have you on at some future date talk about your work with the Nakamadi. But uh, right now we're getting a little strapped with time. But uh, okay. thank yeah, you so much. It, too I, much detail, no, know. no, it's been great. Believe me, for the listeners, this is uh, this is bread and butter. This is what they want to hear. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Well, I'm happy to discuss it at any time. And there you have it, my beloved truth seekers. That was John Turner, author of Sethian Gnosticism and the Platonic Tradition, professor of religious studies at the University of Nebraska and one of the original translators of the Nag Hammadi Library, or NHL. And he prepared for us a feast on Sethian Gnosticism and many of its derivatives. And looking into the depraved mind of the lovely Bishop Irenaeus is always dessert for modern Gnostics. For the old boot is one of the greatest avatars for the demiurge we have at hand. And I believe an important lesson from all of this is understanding that the Sethians are not the only seed of Seth. After all, Gnostics care little about apostolic succession, tradition, lineage, race, creed, or gender unlike the Orthodox. Our families, our ties, are bound together by spiritual bonds and ancestry. Let Cain and Abel deal with their psychic and hylic affairs. We are like the nomadic Seth that seeks the original truths from the original source. We are the kindred and heart of both Seth and Norea. We are the astral children of Sophia and the Cosmic Christ. And that is the hidden message that Jesus said in both the canonical and the Gospel of Thomas, saying number 55. Jesus said, Whoever does not hate his father and mother cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not hate his brothers and sisters and carry the cross as I do will not be worthy of me. In other words, relinquish the old ways and understand that you are the supernal descendants of something greater. And it's going to be a lot of work. This has been Coffee, Cigarettes, and Gnosis, broadcast from the virtual Alexandria. As always, I am... Eternally grateful you join me in the eternal now for even just a little bit. But the road is ended, the song is over, thought I'd have something more to say. But don't cultivate any troubles, my beloved true seekers, because like heaven above you, the spy that loved you, I'm keeping all of your secrets safe with me tonight. <laughs>
hello and goodbye as always. I am stretched on your grave and will lie there forever.